all for attending. Uh, as you said, I am Eric Zontrup. I'm the, the CEO and chair of GR Silver. Um, this is an aerial shot. You can see that we're focused on the Plumosas project in Sinaloa, Mexico. Um, it's, uh, it looks like it's a rugged terrain. It can be, but we also have excellent access, and I'll get into that in a second. As a former analyst, and I spent 34 years as an analyst and originally a geologist, the, the, what I always focused on in an investment was the five Ps, just to keep it simple, a project. Um, we have the Plumosas project, as I mentioned, with 430 square kilometers of core concessions. Place, you have to be in a place you wouldn't feel badly about bringing your kids to. Um, people, we have an excellent team, and I'll get into that as well. Price, we think we're at an attractive entry point. I wouldn't be here if I didn't believe that to be the case. And of course, potential, the potential to grow. As I said, we're located in Sinaloa, and you can see in this the, uh, the Plumosas project, all 430 square kilometers of it. We also have an additional 300 square kilometers of non-core that we uh, have available for optionality. Uh, just off the map here to the left, to the west, is Mazatlan, where one can fly in, and then it's a 45-minute drive by Toll Highway to El Rosario, and from there, it's about an hour into the project on dirt roads that are accessible year-round. In addition, there are two former mines. On the bottom left to the southwest is the La Trinidad mine that was started by Eldorado Gold and then operated for a few years as well by Mako Gold. We acquired the concession and uh, it is a former mine so there is power direct to site. On the top right of the concession up to the northeast is the Plumosas mine which is a former base metal mine operated by Grupo Mexico from 1986 to 2001 and so also has power direct to site. The three dashed lines that slash through the property are major structural features. And as anyone who knows the area knows, the, the uh, uh, Sierra Madre Occidental in that region, those northwest structures are key deep-seated structures that act as a plumbing system to bring uh, heat and metals to the surface. Within the Plumosas project, our focus has entirely been on the San Marcial area and the former Plumosas mine area. San Marcial, we've been working on expanding that. We made a new discovery last summer in the southeast area. Plumosas is all about increasing grade. But with that ex existing infrastructure at Plumosas, and I mentioned we have 7.4 kilometers of underground development there, uh, that gives us a big head start, not to mention the permits and the relationships with the local ejidos. But bottom line, the most important aspect in the next few weeks is a potential catalyst. And that catalyst is the delivery of a resource update for both Plumosas and San Marcial. We promised that we would deliver it before the end of March, and we're on schedule to do so. Zeroing in now on the San Marcial area, you can see an aerial view to the west. Um, on the left, the San Marcial area. To the right, Plumosas mine. They're about five kilometers apart obviously road access as well. At San Marcial, you can see the, the bright red uh, box is the 2019 resource estimate area. The drilling that we've done has extended the footprint of the deposit, and you can see the blue dashed box that indicates that. On the right, you can see the Plumosas mine in, within that ridge. San Marcial is unique in that it is a silver dominant deposit. So we're looking at 90, 95% of the value of the deposit in silver. So I will be talking about silver, not silver equivalent intersections. You can see the bright red slash in the center of the slide. And that bright red slash is that 2019 resource estimate. There was a belief at, the, at one time that this was a VMS or even surface enrichment. That's simply not the case. And I'll show you in a long section shortly that that's not the case. The blue area is the new Southeast Discovery area, and that was a blind discovery. You can see the dotted red line that extends to the Southeast from San Marcial, and that is a very important geological contact between the upper volcanics in the foreground, and in, within the, that area is, and to the, further to the west, is the, uh, the, are the lower vol sedimentary volcanic package. And it's that contact where the mineralization seems to be residing right now. There are some parallel structures to that. But also very importantly, you can see there a northeast fault package that cross-cuts that contact. And it was the recognition of that cross-cutting structure and the deflection within the contact 
that helped us to zero in on that area. In addition, we did a 14,000 sample lithogeochem survey, in other words, sampling the rock on a grid every 25 meters, and that highlighted those, those ovals in the, in the white dashed lines. And those ovals are indicative of silver anomaly at surface. So we reasoned that that could very well be mineralization at depth. So we slammed our first hole into that area, and that hole delivered 101.6 meters of 308 grams of silver. That's, again, silver, not silver equivalent. Since that time, we've been drilling in different orientations to make sure we had a good handle on the geometry of the mineralization, and, um, and we have definitely expanded the footprint there. This is that long section I was talking about, northwest to southeast. At the top, you can see the cross-hatched area of the original mineralization, the original resource estimate from 2019. That was originally 52 holes. Since that time at Sons of San Marcial, we have drilled 75 holes, 10,500 meters, that have demonstrated very clearly mineralization extending structurally controlled to depth. And we pulled some nice holes there. Um, 38 meters of 299 grams silver, um, 18 meters of 773 grams of silver. But then we also made this important discovery to the southeast. And you can see that, that blue area off to the left between the two dashed blue lines. And so it's also important to note that within those broad intersections of silver mineralization are some very, very high grade uh, uh, veins as well. And those veins are running several kilos over meter type widths. In addition, the, the bright yellow boxes are indicating that we have cross structures that are also high in gold. So we're looking at off to the, to the northwest, you can see that one meter of 205 grams per ton gold. So there's some very, very high precious metals mineralization. We are definitely developing an understanding of the importance of those cross-cutting structures, and consequently our hit rate has been going up very nicely. Thank you very much. This is another view now to the northwest to southeast uh, on, a, on a long section, and you can see, again, the red area is the 2019 resource area. The olive is the hydrothermal breccia that is important, residing at the contact between the upper and lower volcanics, and we've also discovered a, a new sub-parallel hydrothermal breccia that is important. And, within, un, and underneath that new hydrothermal breccia, you can see the stockworks that are hosting some of those broad intersections of silver mineralization. So we're quite excited about the potential there. And you can bet that in 2023, we will be extending further along that southeast contact to see what those other silver anomalies at surface represent. Now, if we move five kilometers to the north, we get to the former Plumosus mine area. And in that area, as a former producer, I mentioned we have 7.4 kilometers of underground, uh, underground development. And in August 21, we produced our first resource estimate for the Plumosis mine area. And that compiled a lot of information from historical drilling, over 500 historical holes drilled by the base metal miners and other operators since that time. And we put out a resource, a polymetallic resource, that featured 45 grams per ton silver. And as we all know, that is not economic. That's a silver anomaly. And so naturally, the share price responded rather negatively to that news. But we wanted to get that news out, that we had all of this historical information there, and that we were bringing that into the public domain. Then we decided the important thing to do was to do a very surgical infill drill program to truly understand what the mineralization is like. Because 45 grams per ton, that doesn't cut it, not of silver. But the original mined average grade of silver in this deposit is 190 grams per ton silver, plus 0.96 gold, plus the lead and zinc. Why the disparity? The answer to that question is that this was drilled off largely by a base metal miner that was focused entirely on lead zinc, and in a large chunk of the time, didn't even assay for silver. And in fact, they didn't sample for silver either. They only sampled where they saw sphalerite and galena, where they saw the, the sulfides for base metals. So we knew from a lot of underground sampling, the underground access is excellent, that the silver mineralization doesn't necessarily live where the sulfides do. So we embarked on a drill program. And since that time, 
we have drilled 186 holes, uh, 11,250 meters since 21, and all of that information has gone into our database. So if you take a look at this section, you can see the green areas. The green areas in the resource block model are 30 to 100 grams per ton silver. That's all very, very low grade. But when we drilled into these areas with our detailed infill program, we were pulling excellent results. Like you can see on the left there, 12.5 meters of 1.1 kilos of silver and equivalent. So there is a lot of high grade information that has come into here that we are bringing into this story that are going to have an impact on the resource block model. We thought we were just going to be exp uh, dealing with the same volume or the same mass of mineralization and just adjusting the grade. But we also discovered that there's an important theme here that's similar to what we see at San Marcial, and that is these cross-cutting structures. They are younger than the original polymetallic hydrothermal breccia, and they bring an additional amount of precious metal mineralization at a relatively <laughs> high grade. So that too is going to have an impact on that resource. I emphasize once again that over the next few weeks we will be delivering the resource update here, and that will take into account all the additional drilling. On the right, you can see a picture there. We're not chasing small veins here. What we're looking at is broad mineralization over tens of meters. On the right is a stope that was mined by Grupo Mexico. It's over 25 meters tall, and you can see the height of the geologists standing there. This is a different beast, and we look to be expanding resources here consistently. You can see the impact on the left. You can see the, the drilling that's been done, the cumulative drilling. We're approaching 50,000 meters. On the right, you can see the impact on resources from the original resource of around 20 million ounces silver to about 40 million ounces silver in 2019, over 50 million ounces of silver when we started to bring in plumosis, and now we're going to see another increment here. We're obviously not providing guidance in advance of that. But you can see the impact of additional drilling. ESG is something that everybody touts. We are, uh, we are not formalizing it as much as we should. We're not celebrating it as much as we should, but we're having an enormous impact on the local community. We are currently employing over 110 employees from the region um, in Mexico, and we have school programs talking about the environment, talking about reforestation. We have reforestation programs. We have a lot of safety activities. We have the two underground situations, both at San Marcial and Plumosas, with a full-time safety engineer for both. And we have regular meetings on, uh, on safety. During COVID, we had very strict COVID protocols. You couldn't get to site unless you had a negative result. And every day before each meal, you got your temperature taken. If you were running a fever, then you were isolated. And that worked out beautifully, and the community appreciated those efforts. Capital structure, we just completed a 30 million unit non-brokered financing. We have two, 262 million shares outstanding, so for a market cap of around 25 million, we have 3 million in the bank, and uh, a lot of those options and warrants are currently out of the money. We have some good institutional support. I was pleased to see with this recent financing, we had support from current, resource, uh, current shareholders and new shareholders. First Majestic remains at 8%. They've ended a property to us to create this portfolio, and so consequently, um, they are there at 8%. Management and insiders are maintaining a, a bit of skin in the game at 6%. In terms of price, in terms of valuation, we are in the doghouse, and we deserve to be. Given that resource that we put out in August 21, we are trading at 75 cents US per ounce in the ground on a measured and indicated basis, which is a steep discount relative to the average, which is closer to 275 in this particular uh, peer group. So it's my thesis personally that when we deliver more ounces in the next few weeks at a higher grade than the market anticipates, that we should see an increase in the valuation. We should emerge from the doghouse and consequently see a movement to the right in this particular table. Management, I'm a former analyst. I spent 34 years as an analyst, originally a geologist, and I'm honored to be working with this company. Marcio Fonseca did a fantastic job in identifying the opportunity, building the portfolio, and he's been the driving force mentoring the geologists in Mexico and moving the company forward. 
We have a great team as well, including our VP um, of Corporate Communication, Brenda, who's here, can answer your questions as well. On the board side, um, I point out Laura Diaz, who is a Mexico City-based lawyer. She's the former Director General of Mines for Mexico. And a recent addition is Larry Taddy, who for 12 years was the CFO at Ag Silver, one of the most important silver discoveries in Mexico in the last two decades. So bottom line, I think we have a great opportunity here, a lot of exploration upside, a very different kind of model than what you might have been hearing about high grade over narrow veins, and we are going to be delivering on a catalyst potentially over the next few weeks. Thank you very much.